Thanks very much, Sean, for that uh, introduction. And, and uh, I'd like to thank especially the organisers of the uh, meeting today and in inviting me over. I've really enjoyed the past few days of being out in the field uh, with Dan and some of his colleagues from the Geological Survey here looking at some of your fantastic rocks through the Maguma Group. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about work we've been doing on pyrite. Uh, you might think, well, pyrite's a pretty boring mineral. We all know what it looks like. It used to be called fool's gold. But actually, pyrite has an incredible array of trace elements in it, and it really gives us a lot of new insights into the genetic history of ore deposits. And I think it's got a lot of application also in mineral exploration. Uh, the reason that there's a lot of work going on in pyrite chemistry currently is that there's been a technological breakthrough in the last 10 years in the development of laser ablation, ICPMS, which allows us to study the chemistry of minerals uh, to a much better degree than we've been able to do before. It's the next generation past the, the electron microprobe. Uh, but it's certainly a, a, a fantastic tool. Uh, I call it the wonder machine because it gives you so much information that I'll try and uh, talk to you about today. So just to outline the talk, I'll be talking briefly about uh, sediment-hosted orogenic gold deposits, so I'll give an introduction to that. I'll introduce what I think is um, a pretty exciting alternative model for the genesis of these deposits, which... Uh, has implications on how you explore for them. Uh, I'll give ben, the Bendigo Goldfield as an example and maybe some comparisons with Maguma because there are so many similarities that people have pointed to in the past. And then move on to talk more about pyrite, the transition of pyrite to pyrotite and how it may have potential in future exploration. So I'll be discussing broadly uh, what I like to refer to just as sediment-hosted gold deposits, they're usually strata-bound or cross-cutting styles. They're disseminated, may have quartz veins associated with them. They're nearly always arsenic-rich with uh, tellurides in some of the systems. They're hosted in uh, black shales or carbonaceous shales with a variable organic co content. Uh, as the main, main host rock. And previously, these ores have been called orogenic gold deposits or toibidide-hosted or carlin-type deposits, and I'd put them all into the same uh, category of sediment-hosted deposits. So just having a look at a few uh, cross-sections of some typical deposits shown here, the Suko log deposit, a uh, very large deposit in Russia, that uh, was found back in the 1960s but has never been mined, has a reserve, uh, a government reserve over it. It's about 60 million ounces of gold that occurs in a overturned anticline. So you can see the yellow zone here is the outline of the ore that is about two and a half grams per tonne sitting in a sequence of uh, carbonaceous mudstones and siltstones with carbonates towards the uh, upper part of the anticline. Here's a long section of the Carlin uh, district, the North Carlin trend, uh, just showing you again with the yellow colours where the ores are and a general strata bound, what I'd call strata bound within the Popovich formation there, another carbonaceous shale unit, uh, but obviously with structural control uh, defining the shapes of those uh, ore, ore bodies. And then uh, down here we've got a couple of sections through, one through the Bendigo Mining District and one through one of your deposits in the Maguma terrain, just showing this more turbidite hosted styles uh, with quartz veins, um, quartz in the hinge zones, um, generally constrained within the shale units, but uh, usually at the shale sandstone contact. But in all these cases, these black shales or carbonaceous shales are critical in the location of these deposits. And I will argue 
uh, today that they're even more important than just being a, a part of the, the stratigraphy. They're, they're actually an integral part of the stratigraphy and without them you wouldn't get these deposits. Just a little bit on terminology. I, I think that <coughs> the term orogenic gold deposits is a pretty misused term and the problem with it is it's a genetic term and genetic terms for all deposits are never very useful because they usually, they don't outlive our changes in genetic ideas. So I think we're better off uh, just using terms like sediment hosted or greenstone hosted or intrusion hosted to describe these types of deposits and avoid all the arguments about whether it's orogenic or intrusion related. So the model I'd like to suggest to you is that gold's not sourced from great depth in these systems, as most uh, models would suggest to you. They're not, it's not coming up deep faults from the mantle. Oop, something's gone wrong. How do we get back into gear again? Right. Oh, move back. So gold's not coming from great depth. I'd suggest to you that it's simply continental erosion that's concentrating gold up in sedimentary basins at the margins of our cratons. So we're concentrating gold in sedimentary rocks, not to ore grade, but it's an upgrading process and we need a second stage, so we're dealing with a two-stage process here, and that second stage is what people would call the orogenic stage or the intrusion stage, which moves the gold out of the sediments and into the structures where we ultimately find the deposits. And your deposits in the Maguma district here are a classic example of these processes. The other important thing is that these deposits are basically arsenic deposits with a little bit of gold in them. And when we talk about and, and hypothesise about where the gold comes from, we have to consider where the arsenic comes from too. You can't divorce them because they're so intimately related in these deposits. So this is the two-stage process which suggests that um, oxidative erosion is basically uh, leading to a movement of gold down our river systems uh, as particulate gold and colloidal gold most likely, it gets into the ocean um, and some of that material in the ocean is then trapped in organic muds on the sea floor to form carbonaceous black shales enriched in gold. So that's the first process. Then the second process is releasing the gold out of those carbonaceous shales and that requires either tectonism or magmatic intrusion to heat up the system and convert pyrite to pyrotite, which is the key reaction, I'd suggest, in mobilising gold into the metamorphic fluid to form the ore deposits. Here's an example, a Google image, of the Lena Gold District in Russia. And that yellow horizon I've outlined there is the Komolko Formation. The Komolko Formation is a very carbonaceous uh, shale and siltstone unit. And if I asked you where's the ore deposit on that map, then some of you I'm sure would be able to point to where it is without doing anything more. It's right there, right in the tightest anticlinal structure of that Komoko formation. It's a 60 million ounce deposit. And all you need to do to form that deposit is basically move gold that's in very low quantity here in an area of that sort of size, about 15 cubic kilometres, and move it out and put it right into that very tight anticline and you've formed the deposit. Now, is that a feasible process to be able to do that? And that's what I want to talk about. We studied this deposit over several years and uh, looked at the history of pyrite. And this is where the value of doing detailed research on pyrite comes in. And one of the simplest things you can do is 
is etch the pyrite or the ores with acid and look at the detailed textures. In this case, there's, oh, there's um, five different generations of pyrite. Very early generation, which is uh, fine grain framboidal type clusters, uh, probably sedimentary diagenetic in nature. And then you get an early diagenetic small cubic pyrite, a later diagenetic to early metamorphic pyrite that's partly euhedral and overgrows the sediments. Then a pyrite we're calling pyrite 4, which when you etch it actually has the fabric, the metamorphic fabric within it. So it's overgrown the metamorphic fabric as obviously a synmetamorphic pyrite and then a later pyrite again that overgrows that, which is a post-metamorphic pyrite. Now, with our laser ablation system, we can analyse all those pyrites and see where the gold is, because the gold's intimately related to these pyrites, but the advantage of the laser is we can see where the invisible gold is, and it's the invisible gold, the gold that's in the structure of the pyrite, that tells us about the timing of that gold-rich fluid. So here's some data from doing laser ablation analyses uh, plotted of these pyrite types and PPM gold on this axis on a log scale. And you can see the pyrite that's got the highest level of gold is actually the first generation of pyrite. It goes from about 1 to 10 PPM gold in that pyrite. It's a very arsenian pyrite, high arsenic levels. You can see the next generation of pyrite's got a little less, the third generation, pyrite 3. As the bulk of pyrite 3 is down here, but we've got little grains of gold further up that the laser hits and it gives a very high number. And that's gold that's released when you recrystallise pyrite 1, which has invisible gold. A lot of that gold moves out and forms free gold uh, in pyrite 3. Pyrite 4, you can see, hasn't got much gold either, pyrite 5, and by the time you've converted the pyrite to pyrotite, it's lost all its gold totally. So although this deposit was interpreted to be typically orogenic and have late-stage gold, we are able to show with a laser that uh, we're dealing with actually very early gold that's being moved around by the late-stage metamorphic processes. So this is, that's what's basically happened that we've uh, gone from high levels to much lower levels. So where's that gold gone? Well, that gold has turned into free gold, which is the resource that you're looking at there at Sugo Log. Most of that resource is a free gold resource with some refractory gold uh, left. Now, the other thing that we can do with the laser ablation system is we can map out uh, the pyrites in great detail so we can run our laser lines back and forth across these areas like you'd do an air mag survey but the lines are, are virtually next to one another in this case and we can produce an image of the gold or any other trace element you want to look at in that particular area and you can see there that this is pyrite one this very fine grained framboidal type of pyrite then you've got a big cube of pyrite three the metamorphic uh, or, or late diagenetic, early metamorphic pyrite. And you can see all the gold, the warm colours here, and that's up to about 10 ppm, that red, is in the early pyrite, in the pyrite one. There's no gold at all in that late, late pyrite, the big cubic pyrite. We can look at other elements, arsenic there. You can see arsenic is actually enriched in the late pyrite uh, more than it is in the early pyrite. Cobalt, uh, cobalt's really good for looking at metamorphic pulsing of the fluids, you'll get very good zonation, which you see there in the cobalt as that large metamorphic crystal has grown. You've had a change in cobalt composition of the, um, of the fluid. And lead, lead gives quite a similar story to gold. The lead's mainly in the early, early pyrites in that case. Well, let's, let's move to the Victorian gold field and just give you a little analogy here of what some of the things we see in Victoria and that we've studied with pyrite uh, compared with what you've got here in the Maguma district. You've probably all seen um, diagrams like this. This is from Clive Wilman, showing you this really tightly folded 
succession that we have in the Bendigo district, um, upright folds, uh, considerable shortening there with uh, the, the gold reefs concentrated in commonly in anticlinal positions. Uh, typical types of reefs, uh, the saddle reefs and the, the leg reefs, uh, neck reefs, um, fairly typical again, I think, of what you have here in Maguma. That's a photograph uh, of one of the reefs, the most recent one that was mined before the company closed down, the Gill Reef. Um, <coughs> very spotty gold in that, can't really be assessed by drilling. Um, and that's one of the major difficulties is trying to assess the grade of these systems. Uh, the gold's usually along the margins of, of these big quartz reefs or associated with the banded uh, black carbonaceous material that's within the reefs. So this is a geological section, just showing you that gill reef there sitting in that anticlinal position in one of the shale units. This is the railway shale. Um, there's other shale units in here. They've all been given a name in the Bendigo system. And uh, Stuart Bull, who was working with me on this uh, study, did a detailed analysis of the sedimentology and the, uh, the number of shales and sands through the sequence you can see there. It's a, it's a succession of turbidites there that are upward finding turbidites with sand rich bases and shale tops. And you can see going up through the succession there. The reefs are, oh, <coughs> pardon me before I move on to the reefs. One of the interpretations that Stuart came up with here was that many of these sands, and in particular a couple of them in the centre there, I think the lights run out of power and it's back again, um, are, are more like grits or fine conglomerates and they probably represent the original channel systems uh, for sedimentation here and the finer silts and carbonaceous shales he interpreted as basically the levee system adjacent to those channels. <coughs> now some of these uh, um, shales are the ones that produce the productive reefs. You can see there the railway shale and the blue shale, a couple of others. Whereas other shales, these lower shales for instance, have never produced productive reefs. So why do some shales produce reefs and uh, some, some not? One of the key things we found was that these shales that have the productive reefs in them also have a very distinctive geochemistry. We call the Vasnaz suite of elements, and that's just after the, the, um, the element names, vanadium, arsenic, moly, selenium, nickel, silver and zinc. And gold, of course, is also concentrated, as I'll show you, in those shales, along with copper and uranium in some instances. Now, they're a suite of elements. They're redox-sensitive elements that are invariably related to organics. Those elements are concentrated in organic-rich uh, sediments. And the interpretation that Stuart put on this was that we're looking at uh, big submarine canyons that are bringing the detritus down. So that's really active erosion by big river systems that are eroding the continent, like we're seeing here off uh, the coast of um, California. And these, uh, these big river systems that are bringing a whole lot of nutrient trace elements, including gold, down into these canyons, uh, and then they're being dispersed on the edges of those uh, in these uh, levee systems. Now, the other thing that's interesting when you have these big rivers coming off with these channels is that they bring out so much nutrient down into the ocean that they they actually spur on the biological activity. And in the uh, Phanerozoic, that would have been an important process in producing the organic matter, which is required to be the trap for, for the metals. So you can imagine around those big channel systems is you've got a whole bloom of organic activity going on. Some of those, uh, th those plankton actually need, need those elements. They thrive off them. They're driven by them and you get a symbiotic uh, reaction between the biology in the ocean and the nutrients and metals that are coming down these river systems. And that's the Vamsnaz suite that I mentioned before, those critical elements 
vanadium, arsenic, molybdenum, selenium, silver, um, zinc are all concentrated um, in that process. So we've done a lot of analyses of the sediments around Bendigo that are well removed from the ore deposits. We find that the sandstones are fairly devoid of, of any significant gold. They're about the average background you'd expect. The grey shales have a little gold in them and the black shales have about nine parts per billion. Now you might say that's not very much gold, but when you've got a lot of black shales in a basin, that's a real source of gold. And the other thing is they're a great source of arsenic because they're, they've got arsenic levels uh, that are in the 20 to 50 parts per million. You can also see that there's high levels of silver in these and the most important thing is the silver to gold ratio. When you get uh, gold enrichment in organic rich sediments by sedimentary processes, it always has a high silver to gold ratio, which is quite different to hydrothermal gold in the vein systems, which has the reverse. It has a very low gold to silver ratio, more gold than silver. But these always have more silver than gold. So this is uh, some plots of our data just showing you uh, plotted against organic carbon and the green dots there are the sandstones and the red dots are grey siltstones and the blue dots are the carbonaceous uh, shales and you can see that there's a pretty good correlation with vanadium, nickel, zinc, copper, silver and gold and they're that part of that Vamsnas suite I was talking about. So those elements are being concentrated around in the levees uh, in the black shales around these, these levees, these big channel systems, and you can imagine as, the, as that basin fills, these channels are moving all over the place uh, across that basin, and we're gradually concentrating up metals within the black shales at different stratigraphic levels uh, as, as the erosion continues. <coughs> the other factor that's worth mentioning is that the, these nutrients that come down these rivers the oceanographers divide them up into what they'd call bioessential trace elements. They're the trace elements taken up by the biology that are critical uh, for its survival in the ocean. Then we have scavenged trace elements. They've got nothing to do with the biology uh, and they actually attach themselves to clay particles and iron oxides and precipitate out on the basin floor that way. And then we've got the conservative elements of which gold is one, which are... Uh, tend to disperse more widely in the ocean. They have a longer residence time in the ocean, uh, but eventually they sediment out also with the organic matter. But they tend to have a longer life. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research on gold, uh, but at this stage it's put in the conservative category. It'll be interesting whether it actually turns out to be a bioessential element uh, involved in, in the biology itself. Now, once that, uh, those metals get into the muds, they don't stay on the organics because on the sea floor, in a normal oxidised sea floor environment, a lot of that organic matter, over 90% of it, re-dissolves in the ocean and just gets converted to CO2. The metals move off the organic matter and they move into pyrite that is growing in the muds, diagenetic pyrite that grows in the muds by the reduction of sulphate to H2S, um, those metals are then taken up by the pyrite. So the, the, the gold moves from the organic layers into the diagenetic pyrite, as does the arsenic, the nickel, the cobalt, the selenium. A lot of those elements move into the pyrite. Some of them don't, like uranium and vanadium. They stay with the organic matter or stay in the sediment matrix. Now, these are what the pyrites look like when we go looking for them under the microscope. They're pretty ratty. Uh, pyrites, the diagenetic types, they're usually in rounded shapes, either clusters of framboids or, or clusters of fine crystals. Uh, they usually get overgrown by later generations of diagenetic and metamorphic pyrites, so when we look at those rocks today, they can have quite complex aggregates of continual overgrowths of later generations of pyrite. <coughs> when we actually use our laser ablation system to map those pyrites. Again, we find that the gold is concentrated usually in the centre of these diagenetic aggregates. There's about 1 ppm gold in the centre of that and it drops off to about 0.1 ppm. You can see other elements like manganese are in the centre too. Sorry, molybdenum 
And that's because molybdenum loves organics and it'll attach straight away to the organic nucleus that this pyrite's growing around. And these pyrites also have a high silver content and a high arsenic content, uh, which is indicative of, of diagenetic pyrites. <coughs> so we're forming these pyrites now in these uh, sediments on our, in our continental margins, and the gold is trapped fairly well in those pyrites. So how do we get the gold out of that system to form the ore deposit? Well, we need to convert the pyrite to pyrotite. That's the simplest way of releasing the gold. And the re reason that's very effective is that pyrotite can't contain gold in its structure. I'll come onto that in a minute. So the, the carbonaceous gold arsenic source rocks I'm talking about, there's some photographs there of typical examples from Suco Log, the Carlin trend where these rocks actually have bituminous veins in them, or from, from Bendigo, a, a similar story. Now, <coughs> We, we find if we go back through the literature, and Boyle and Crockett and a, a number of people have put this data together, uh, we find that generally gold and arsenic are enriched universally in black shales. It's not just these shales around ore deposits, but many black shales have enrichments of gold and arsenic, and gold contents have been measured um, over uh, 10 parts per billion in, in carbonaceous shales compared to the background in igneous rocks, the background in the mantle, which is much lower by comparison. The same story with arsenic. Carbonaceous shales are by far the biggest reservoir of arsenic of all our crustal rocks. So it's, it's pretty logical. When I was out in the field uh, yesterday looking at your Maguma rocks along the ovens, I was absolutely amazed at the amount of arsenopyrite in some of your black shales and, and sands that are interbedded with the black shales. I've never seen rocks like this where it's obvious to me that that arsenopyrite was probably crystallising out of the ocean. It's actually sedimentary arsenopyrite. Usually we have sedimentary arsenian pyrite. And you can put about 10 weight percent arsenic into pyrite, but if there's more arsenic than that in the ocean at the time, then it's going to come out as arsenopyrite, which is, seems to have happened in your scenario. So you've got some of the most arsenic-rich black shales anywhere in the world, I would suggest. <coughs> Carbonaceous shales usually contain from 3 to 30 times average crustal gold and 15 to 100 times average crustal arsenic. And no other rocks have those characteristics. No other rock is as good a source rock for these gold deposits. Again, that's the sort of pyrite we're dealing with in those three examples there. It all looks pretty similar. Very small aggregates of pyrite clustered together in uh, framboid type shapes and they can contain anything up to about 10 ppm gold and thousands of ppm arsenic. But most of the time during metamorphism they get overgrown by euhedral pyrites and you can see here, you may be able to see that when this is etched, you can see a central core there that was the original diagenetic pyrite, and it's got the metamorphic pyrite growing around it. And when we map that, you can see the gold is right in the core, in the diagenetic part, along with the silver and along with the molybdenum. There's no gold in the overgrowth metamorphic pyrite, but there's plenty of nickel and arsenic, which is typical of those overgrowth metamorphic pyrites. We've analysed thousands of pyrites from black shales and we haven't worried about whether they're near gold deposits or not. So this is a compilation of black shales, some in basins that don't host gold, some in basins that do host gold. And you can see there, this is about 2,500 analyses. Uh, you can see that universally they've got um, more silver than gold, except for a couple of ones out here, which are pretty suspect and could well be hydrothermal. Hardly anything is plotting in the hydrothermal field. This is one of the best classification methods between hydrothermal pyrite and diagenetic pyrite, the simple gold-silver ratio. And you can see there's a good trend in that, that ratio. And I'd put a line on that diagram at about 250 ppb gold in the pyrite and suggest that if you've got black shales that are plotting up here, the, where the pyrite plots up here, then it's a potential source rock to form gold deposits. If it's plotting down here, you really haven't got enough gold in your pyrite 
to uh, consider it as a reasonable source rock. Here's gold against tellurium showing a very similar pattern. Most of the tellurium that forms in these deposits is also coming out of the black sales. They're a very good source of tellurium as you can see there. And that there again is the, is the cutoff line uh, on that diagram. Now, <clears throat> if we consider the pyrite that's deeply buried in the basin, in our, our lower part of the basin, which we'd say is our source area for the fluids and the gold, then the history of that pyrite is usually that it starts off as, as I've shown you, as little uh, crystals clustered together. During diagenesis, it gets overgrown by another stage of pyrite. During the initial stages of metamorphism, it gets overgrown by another stage of pyrite, which is typically euhedral. And then at some temperature and organic carbon content, it'll convert to pyrotite. And that's the critical stage because we've been able to trap the gold and the arsenic and tellurium in these centres of these pyrites, but when we go to pyrotite, they're released because pyrotite doesn't have a structure that allows you to retain gold and arsenic in, in, in the crystal. <coughs> so that reaction, looking at it in more detail, is the simple chemical reaction there of pyrite plus water plus carbon because you've got to reduce the pyrite with, with a reduct, reductant. In this case, it's organic material sitting in the muds. And that goes to pyrotite plus H2S and CO2. So those are released into the fluid along with the gold and the arsenic. And that's a fairly typical composition for an orogenic type fluid. You may also be releasing CH4 in very reduced, very organic rich uh, systems. This is an example from the Bendigo district uh, where the pyrite is, is partly replaced. So we've, we've um, captured this example where we can see the pyrotite replacing the pyrite. This is the pyrite here, the pyrotite's around its edges. And when we laser that um, and actually um, put a laser hole into the pyrite, we can see it's got about half a ppm gold and arsenic in it. And, relatively high silver and tellurium. And when we analyse the pyrotite that's replacing it, it's got virtually no gold and no arsenic. We're right down at the bottom of our detection limit. We've got a little bit of silver left and no tellurium. So you can see that we're losing those elements out of that pyrite and it's a great source then. And we've done a lot of analyses of gold and, and arsenic in, in pyrite and pyrotite. In the Bendigo district, again, uh, that's the difference. Uh, you can see pyrite has a gold content of averaging about 0.5 of a ppm, uh, but the pyrotite uh, has about 0.01. Similar story with the arsenic. So they're totally losing it when they go through that metamorphic transition. And that transition happens about 500 metres below the productive reefs in the Bendigo district only 500 metres below. So it's probably starting to occur at about 280, 300 degrees if you've got organic rich sediments and you've got water moving through them. So that's the, the model we'd suggest uh, that in a sedimentary basin like the Maguma or, or the, the uh, Victorian basin, they are thick piles of turbidites, a lot of organic rich shales within these basins and at depth uh, when we go through the pyrite to pyrotite transition, we're releasing gold, sulphur, uh, arsenic, tellurium that can move into the metamorphic fluid and uh, move up to deposit uh, those, those ore bodies. There's obviously a lot of silica moving too because many of these deposits are, are quartz rich, but not all of them. Suco log, for instance, doesn't have significant quartz veins. It's just a disseminated pyrite uh, system. Here's another example just to show you more detail where we've mapped a composite aggregate where you can see an internal uh, early diagenetic core and a later diagenetic overgrowth and then a metamorphic overgrowth. Uh, when we map that, uh, we can actually see the gold in the core, but the more important thing that is obvious is the gold in the rim of, of that pyrite along with the very high arsenic in that pyrite. And it's just modelled here on the one below, just showing you the early gold that's trapped in the diagenetic pyrite, but then the late gold, which is the fluid 
that's actually forming the gold reefs. And this pyrite is sitting out in the sediments away from the reefs, but it's obviously telling us that the fluids that moved up to form those reefs were dumping out minor amounts of gold. It's only the order of a few ppm on the outer rim of those pyrites. So there's the stage one accumulation of gold and then the metamorphic stage that produces the ore body, stage two. Now we can see that up at the level of the ore deposit because that we can see those pyrites that are around this ore deposit and that history. You don't see it down here because all the pyrite has gone to pyrotite down there uh, and all, all you're going to get is pyrotite. And you've got a lot of pyrotite in your Maguma district. It's a little more complex than Bendigo because you've got two ways of converting pyrite to pyrotite here. You've got the metamorphic way, which is what we see also in Bendigo, but then you've got those granites, those slightly younger granites that are going to convert pyrite to pyrotite also uh, when you're within their aureal. So you've got that complication of an overprinting second generation of uh, py pardon me, pyrite to pyrotite. Now, this is very common. It's been recognised in the literature for some time, this conversion and its importance. It was pointed out by the Russians back in 1982 and uh, there's been quite a bit of research since then and we've found it in most gold districts that we've worked in. Uh, you can see that pyrite to pyrotite transition going on and the potential source of gold. It's also a source of sulphur, of course, because H2S is given off by that reaction and when you look at sulphur isotopes, of orogenic deposits, and this is an example of suco log here, there's a big, uh, big wide uh, <coughs> trend in the Dell S34 data there, which is typical of sedimentary pyrite, but as you go up metamorphic grade and, and go into these um, later parogenesis of pyrite and pyrotite, it all narrows down to the one number, which is the mean of all that sedimentary pyrite. So you're homogenising the sedimentary pyrite to produce that. And, um, we published this several years ago showing the relationship between uh, pyrite, uh, sulphur isotopes in pyrite from orogenic gold deposits around the world with the seawater curve. Sangster did this for VHMS deposits about 35 years ago to argue that seawater was an important component in VHMS fluids. We would argue the same thing. Seawater has to be an important component, otherwise you wouldn't get this relationship. But it's, it's not a direct relationship in the sense that seawater was precipitating the pyrite that went into the sediments that was then released to go into the orogenic gold deposit. So it's a two-stage process again. Now I just want to fish, finish up, if I've got time, um, to talk a little bit about our thoughts on how pyrite can be used in uh, mineral exploration. So it's not only an important genetic tool, but we'd say it's an important tool uh, for vectoring towards deposits. And why is it so useful? Well, for a number of reasons I've talked about. It's very common in the halos of deposits. It absorbs a whole lot of trace elements um, and it's very common, especially in gold systems. Uh, when you analyse pyrites with spot analyses, which is what we're suggesting here as the, as the technique, you get a, a real spaghetti diagram of all the trace elements you're looking at but you can sort them out through using the computer, of course, and come up with parts per million uh, levels. But you can see the gold curve there, for instance, is the red one at the bottom. And when we drilled into that particular pyrite, we, we went into a zone of pyrite that had gold in it, and then we went into a zone with no gold. This is a, a time at the bottom here, so you can see us drilling into the, into the pyrite with gold and then no gold. So that pyrite zoned with one part of it being gold-bearing and another part not. If you look at the bottom one there, it's, it's, there's a different picture there. It's fairly uniform gold and then suddenly a spike and that spike tells us that the laser actually drilled into a grain of gold, a grain of free gold sitting in that pyrite. So that's all really valuable information that the laser gives you, even with a spot analysis, it's giving you important information. We've uh, analysed pyrite from about 50 orogenic gold deposits throughout Western Australia and about five VHMS deposits. And the objective here was to see if we could just simply distinguish between pyrite that comes from a VHMS system 
compared to pyrite that comes from an orogenic system? Because that's, that's an important question to ask when you're exploring in the Ilgarn in Western Australia. You want to know what you're exploring for if you've hit a little bit of pyrite in a drill hole. Now, the orogenic systems tend to have halos of pyrite around them, and this is a model we've developed for a, a typical orogenic system. It's not based on any particular deposit, just on all our data, where the gold content of the pyrite, the arsenic content, the tellurium content, thallium, mercury, they all gradually change as you move out away from the deposit, with the highest gold obviously right in the, in the centre of the deposit. We've also developed discrimination diagrams uh, for pyrite of different genesis. The, the simple diagram that's been used for a long time, you, plotting cobalt against nickel for pyrite, can be quite useful um, because nickel-rich pyrites are common in orogenic gold deposits and MVT deposits, for example, whereas cobalt-rich ones are more common in these other styles of generally higher temperature, more oxidised systems than, than the others. <coughs> Uh, if you plot some of our data from various deposits there and the, the top three there, De Grusa, Jaguar and Gosen Hill are VHMSs, whereas Sunrise Dam, Waluna are two orogenic gold deposits. Don't worry about the other two, they were just thrown in their different styles. But we can see there that all the orogenics plot in the nickel-rich field and all the VHMSs plot in the cobalt-rich field. And that's very simple. I wouldn't guarantee it works all the time, but it's probably got about an 80% success rate. The next diagram we use is the simple gold-silver diagram for pyrite. And again, uh, silver is always greater than gold uh, from sediment, sedimentary pyrite, volcanogenic pyrite, and for tellurium-rich orogenic deposits, interestingly. Whereas for arsenic-rich orogenic deposits, gold's always greater than silver. Uh, another one that works really well is just tungsten against tin. Orogenic systems tend to have a variable amount of tungsten without much tin, whereas VHMS systems have a variable amount of tin without much tungsten. Now, we can put that all together uh, and come up with scores for VHMS, scores for orogenic, and that's all the data that we've, we've analysed, and you can see there nicely that all the VMS pyrites plot in one field, we'll call the VMS field, and all the orogenics plot in another field. Those that is arrows coming out are arrows that are pointing towards high grade. So you move along those arrows basically as you're going to high grade or vectoring in to an ore centre. And so the, the application to exploration here is to answer two questions. Firstly, when you've got a bit of pyrite in a drill hole, is it telling you anything about fertility? Is it related to an orogenic system or a VHMS system or something totally different? And then secondly, is it telling you anything about distance from ore? Is it giving you a vectoring capability so that if you've got a number of holes that are drilled in an area, can you actually use those holes to tell you where the centre of the system is likely to be? So our approach here that we're now doing with various companies in Australia is to take some of their past drill holes that have been drilled into prospects and um, just take a few samples of pyrite from those holes Sorry, I'll just go back. A few samples of pyrite. So in this example, we've got three zones that had a bit of pyrite in them. We'll take three samples from those, um, look at them under the microscope, etch them, do the laser ablation work. We can do lead isotope ratios at the same time. I haven't got time to talk about that, but that gives you very valuable information on timing. We can do sulphur isotopes if required. And the sort of cost to do that sort of work on a drill hole is about $2,500. Now, that might appear to be very costly for a geochemical technique, but the data you're getting out of it is just like the data you'd get out of a downhole EM survey. Downhole EM survey is telling you about an off-hole anomaly, and that's what this is doing. It's telling you if you've got likely to have an off-hole anomaly, which means you should be drilling a few more holes to try and target into what that anomaly is. We've used it on... Um, drill holes that are actually available to the public. These are co-funded drill holes. Most of the states in Australia, the geological surveys offer a co-funded drilling program where the government puts up half the money if you put a good case up for drilling. Not just drilling near the head frame, but drilling out on uh, more greenfields type targets. And we've used this approach on some of those drill holes just to see if the result 
is compatible with uh, where they were drilling and how far they were from a known deposit. Uh, so an example here where a company was drilling a banded iron formation system along strike from a known gold, orogenic gold deposit, and that's the data that was collected showing you that you're transgressing, you're well outside the background, and you're in a distal to proximal position with respect to that ore body, which is what we'd expect because they were drilling a long strike from a known deposit. So we've tested it on a number of holes. One of the holes actually led to a uh, recognition of a v VHMS system in a district that hadn't been recognised before. So that was a real plus, and it gave, suddenly gave potential for VMSs in that district that wasn't known about. So just to finish up, the take-home points, uh, uh, the concept that actually it's erosion of continents that's delivering gold and capturing it in our basins. We're not looking at deep fluids necessarily. And it's biological activity around these channels, the nutrient activity that is capturing the gold in the organics. We need a second process then to release the gold. And those key trace elements, the VAMSNAS elements, are the ones you're looking for when you're looking for a potential source rock. That the pyrite goes through an evolutionary process, but the key reaction is pyrite going to pyrotite, which releases gold and arsenic. And if you've got a, a data set of uh, gold analyses of sedimentary pyrites, then you can use that to predict whether a particular black sail is likely to be a favourable source rock for gold or whether it's an unfavourable source rock. We can also uh, use gold in a a pyrite in a vectoring sense um, in the way that we've suggested of targeting it into a deposit and uh, come up with a, a vectoring diagram that will allow us to have some idea of fertility and proximity to mineralisation. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, in very simple terms, it's most likely the bisulfide complex because you're releasing H2S at the same time. So you've actually got the ideal environment to transport gold away from, from that source area. You know, that occasionally you'll find gold right next to pyrotite, uh, but it's not the common, the common occurrence is that the gold is further away. In, in Maguma, you've got this complication I mentioned that you've got the later granites and uh, any pyrite that was left in the system when those granites came in probably converted to pyrotite. And you've got to be a long way from those granites as we were down in the ovens area. And that was the first time we saw uh, sedimentary pyrite. Everywhere else we'd looked, it had all gone to pyrotite. No, I, I, I don't know whether you can apply that channel every model everywhere, and it depends on where you are with respect to the, the coastline. Obviously, when you're in the distal passage of the turbidites, you won't really find the channel um, because you're, you're just not close enough in. You're out beyond those channels when you've gone out into the fan, basically. So in Bendigo, we think we can recognise those channels and they could be used as an exploration tool because you know, it's around those channels that you expect the best gold to be. But when you're out in the fan, uh, where, where it's a lot harder to recognise channels, then it's probably not practical. 